That's even better. Good day, good day, everyone. Welcome to this uh, conversation anchored in humanity, anchored in love, and anchored in the opportunity to disrupt and create a movement of change. Uh, my name is Aurora Archer. I am the CEO and co-founder of The Opt-In, and I am beyond thrilled to be joined by my friend and colleague and fellow B Corp, Rooney. Want to introduce yourself, Rooney? Yes, and I would probably just start with a, a, a immense gratitude and thanks for having me here. Um, you know, I'm... I, I've, I've always looked up to you and as I've started to do more of this work and we've been, people have been sending us resources and people to follow, your name has come up, I've seen you speak. So to get to like this one-on-one -on -one connection with you um, is really exciting for me and to be invited to be a part of this conversation is is a big deal for me um, in some of the, the work I've been doing. So just immense amount of gratitude to you for having me and for those uh, behind the scenes for pulling it off, Lauren and many others. So. My name is Rooney Castle. Um, I'm located here in Burlington, Vermont. Um, I work for a B Corp uh, called Rhino Foods, and we are a manufacturer of inclusions that go into the ice cream, the packaged ice cream companies. So well known for like Ben and Jerry's cookie dough um, and some others like that. So very excited to be here um, and, and anxiously anticipating the conversation. Yes, indeed. Um, and yummy. And if it weren't the hour of the day it, it is, mm -hmm. um, I would have bugged you for bringing some of the rhino good stuff <laughs> into Anytime. the room. <laughs> Anytime. So um, may I invite you and our audience that's gathered with us here today, Rooney, uh, to just sort of um, anchor and center ourselves in the space and the conversation that we are going to have. Um, for those, if this is accessible to you, we invite you to close your eyes as we take three of the deepest breaths that we've taken yet today. We're going to anchor ourselves by taking these three deep breaths. And we call in love. We call in the wholeness of our humanity. And we call in the golden thread that connects each and every one of this in this global connection we call humanness. Thank you, Rooney. Thank you all. Appreciate you all for setting this container with both Rooney and I today. Um, so let's start by sharing a little bit about our journeys. Um, I'll start if that's okay, Rooney. And then, um, you know, I come to this work, you and I have a vested interest in creating change in our personal selves, first and foremost, in our leadership, as well as in the organizations and every single thing we have the opportunity to touch. Um, I come to this work having spent over 20 years in corporate America as a global marketing executive across four distinct industries. And I was also, you know, the executive that was a part of every African American ERG, the Latinx community. My background is I am Afro Latina. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And I believe that despite all the well-intentioned efforts um, across the DEI landscape, we have made very little progress in a space that I am very invested in seeing evolve, which is our corporate and company and workplaces. And that starts first and foremost with what I now get to impact and support the evolution of, which is the B Corp community. Um, and the movement of B Corp creating that modeling for the rest of corporate America. Um, at the opt-in, we're a culture strategy firm 
focused on partnering with visionary leaders and organizations to do two fundamental things that we believe um, are critical for us to evolve, our culture strategies and create a more racially equitable world. One is that we have to first start with education. We have to increase the knowledge and skill set of our leaders and our organizations. And by doing that, we have to begin having the conversation that has uh, been absent for too long within our corporate and, and home environments, which is we have to talk about race. Mm -hmm. And we have to build our racial literacy skills in order to build our cultural competence skills where we are navigating and leading organizations, teams, and people representing all identities, all social backgrounds, and all cultural and ethnic representations. And then the second thing that we do is that once we build up those skill sets, then we help organizations apply those skill sets to ensuring that they are creating narratives, communication strategies, and products and services that are much more representative and inclusive of the needs and wants of the global majority. And so it's not easy um, and challenging at times because quite frankly, Rooney, my client base is you. White male CEOs of medium to large size organizations who struggle to understand um, that to engage in this work, it's not about checking a box. It's not about relegating or delegating it to the DEI representative, or dare I say, uh, the black or brown person uh, at the medium, at the mid level or executive level of your organization, and giving this, uh, giving them the role of DEI strategy on top of their day job. Mm -hmm. So, um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to sort of talk about your personal journey and what you are doing. Yeah, um, and that pairs very well um, because, <laughs> like, there's a lot of there's a lot of me out there, right? There's a lot of white men in, in positions of privilege and power mm -hmm. um, who don't who have who have a lot to learn and don't know um, don't know what they don't know and um, think they know a lot more than they actually do. And I 100% put myself in that category. Um, so my my journey to this place has been sort of twofold. I'll sort of speak to it in two ways. Uh, there's the journey to how the heck am I 35 years old and the CEO of, of anything, frankly. And there's a lot of there's a lot of privilege that comes with how I got there. Um, so Rhino Foods is a family owned business. It was started by my my family. We could spend hours talking about the layers of generational privilege. Um, that allowed my my parents to, to be in position to, to um, be able to take the risks, to be able to have the financial mm -hmm. support, um, to be able to you know lend loan money, all the things that we know um, help people like my folks and many others be able to to be entrepreneurial in the way that they were able to, and not to diminish any of the hard work that went into that. But again, a whole that's another story for another time. We get to connect. Um, and so I'm, I continue to be the byproduct of that of that privilege. And um, I would say I, I like I knew that I know that, but my understanding of what that means has substantially changed. And so um, about well three years ago, uh, in, until about three years ago, I was very much clueless. I would describe myself as clueless when it comes to racial equity um, and understanding racial issues and specifically understanding my whiteness um, and how that relates to how I move throughout the world in, in every single possible way. Um, I was very fortunate to be invited um, by a friend of mine, Jay Cohen Gilbert, who a lot of folks in this call will know. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, um, him and another gentleman, Kevin, Kevin Epler, got together and said, we, we've got to do something. They had um, the, the black and brown people in their lives calling out to them to say, 
look who is the least present in these conversations. And it's, it's people that look like you, it's, it's white men. Um, and you're the ones who have the most power and influence and the most accountability to actually be there um, because a lot of the reasons why we're here. Um, and so that invitation, uh, to be fully honest, has completely changed my life. And it's been a two and a half, well, I have to own it. So they invited me. I came for a couple calls. It's like when this was being built and I was like, oh, I'm too busy for this. This isn't for me. And I flamed out. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, they were, you know, persistent. And when the sort of the next onboarding group came in about a few months later, I was like, okay, I, I need to, to really fully commit to this. And I, and I have ever said, so about two and a half years. And it's, as you talked about the, the, the two, that first part around education. So the invitation was to a group called white men for racial justice, which we can talk more about, but it's a, it's a space, it's affinity space for all those identifying as white men mm -hmm. and to come together, to have a space to do just that, to learn, um, to mostly for me again, to unlearn what we've been taught and to relearn and have a space to do that in a vulnerable way with each other. Um, because frankly, as white men, also again, speaking for myself, vulnerability has always been a challenge for me. Showing up in spaces and being vulnerable with others is a challenge. And so to have this space where we can come together um, and learn and unlearn and reflect and it's deep personal ex excavation, um, is been transformational. Um, and so that pairs really well with like where I'm at in my, my professional journey of understanding my own privilege and the opportunity I have today and moving forward as a leader of this company, um, that influences so many people's lives, not just within our walls here, but also in our community. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that, but I'll probably just stop there and, and say, education for me was the number one piece. Um, and I'm so, I'm, I'm very much at the beginning of this journey. And it's that, that second part you talked about is what is the application? And I feel mm -hmm. an extreme amount of responsibility and accountability to like, now that I know what I know, I can't unknow that. I can't unsee it. I can't unlearn it. And so what do I do with it? Um, and so well, I'm just psyched about this conversation. So I love this um, because I want to peel back the layers on a couple of things that you said. So thank you for, for setting the context of your journey, of your personal journey, um, and also acknowledging that, A, that it's a journey and that you're at the beginning of it. And you're, you're a fully formed, grown human being, Rumi. And, you know, this is what we say to folks. It's like, okay, does it matter? When we find out, we find out. And when we start to make that commitment, because you said something very important. You said, I flamed out. And I wanna go back to that because I think that that flaming out has such huge implications um, for the building of cross-racial relationships. I think it has implications with regards to the trust. And I think it has implications for the reality of doing this work. And so do you mind unpacking that a little bit? Uh, because, and, and, and unpacking it because I think this is where we get stuck, where white people specifically get stuck and where brown and black people would love to sort out how do you unstuck yourself from that moment? Yeah. Um, again, rooting it in my own experience, it's until there's, until there's proximity to it, it's so hard to, to, to get it. And for, again, for, somebody like myself, my, the circles I move throughout are built to protect me from that and to, to not have me be proximate to the, the things that are going on. And so my flame out comes because I don't see the pro like, I don't feel, I don't internally feel the problem. 
I can conceptualize it. I can read about that, but it's all external to me. I don't, there's no connection to me and what's happening or that I'm, that I am personally internalizing or seeing. And so that's real in that connection. It's, it's really hard to make. And so I think what happens is people have this like motivation, you know, after an event like the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a big wave of, of people getting involved and thinking it's time for me to do something. Mm -hmm. And then at different rates and dr dropout points, people flame out. Um, people like me, I should say, um, because it's, it's an external concept. And again, on myself, I'm like, as long as I'm not the, the one that's, um, you know, doing outward expressions or explicit expressions of, of racism or hate, I'm, I'm a good one. I'm like, I've, I've got, you know, I'm like, I'm got my stuff together here. I do a lot of good things at work. I volunteer. I I've got a couple black friends, like in Vermont, which is harder to find. And I work with a bunch of black people. Like I'm, I'm good. And for me, again, the, what has, what, what keeps me showing up every, every Tuesday night for white men for racial justice is the community that we've built, but it's really the proximity that has brought me to some of these issues. It's relationships that I've built mm -hmm. and the trust that I've had that, that I've been able to build with the people of color in my life mm -hmm. that have been now trust me enough to share their experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's so, you know, and it's, and again, I'm always aware too of how traumatic it can almost be for people like yourself, or I've had feedback to, to watch somebody like me who's 35 years old and is like, oh my God, this exists, you know, like that's a very, I've realized I have to be careful with how I speak about that. But in this space, I feel like we're, that's what we're digging into. And this is a yes. safe space, which I appreciate yes. you creating that for me. And, but don't, I, I recognize the burden of, of that exists in this conversation for you. Um, but it is, it's just like it, your, my eyes are open. And it, but it, to me, it's that proximity. And so how, like, how do we get people like myself to have mm -hmm. proximity mm -hmm. when the systems and structures are, are like specifically designed to keep us from feeling proximate and it's at an arm's length. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> so a statistic that I'll share with folks um, that are joining us today is 75% of white Americans do not have a personal or intimate relationship with a person of color. And so this issue of proximity um, is, 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 is very uh, is very clear and to your point, it's designed that way so that we don't know each other. Mm. You know, one of the biggest things I always say when when white folks say to me, oh, but I have, you know, my best friend is black and you know, I have this wonderful colleague. And so I always say, I actually don't, uh, I don't measure a friendship or the partnership between a brown or black person based on what a white person tells me. I ask the brown and black person because we uh, have become very adept at navigating relationships with white people based on our safety, uh, based on um, the trust and the reality of how honest, truthful and vulnerable I can actually show up being in a moment um, with you and in our relationship. Mm. And sometimes that's very hard for white people to hear. Um, and I also believe that one of the other, the third thing I always say to my white friends is when a brown and black person comes to you and shares honestly and vulnerably their truth and their feedback, listen. Mm. Because there is much more at risk for them sharing who they are with you than vice versa. And so I love you sharing that and anchoring connection and anchoring proximity as a key pathway uh, for your, you know, for your personal growth and what you're sharing and modeling here today. 
Yeah. Um, and it's very tenuous, right? Yeah. We, we've had these conversations. It's very tenuous because there's a po point where I don't believe white people are ready, right? To be in conversations, vulnerable conversations, um, what we would say in mixed company. Right? Mm. Yeah. It, it can what, be quite harmful. Yeah. And what your comments are making me think about again is like, for me, again, the, the beauty of this, of the work that I'm doing, the journey I'm on with, with WMRJ is that it's so many times, myself included, people like myself show up and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm oh, okay, I'm ready to take action. Like I'm ready to, and, and, act, and, and like showing up means two things typically. It's like, I think first and foremost, it's, we try to lead. It's like, we've solved problems. Like, okay, here's like, here's the one pager about this. We always joke in our WMRJ group with, with our, with our, our BIPOC leaders that we call our equity advisors. They're always like, you all want a, a, a one pager. Like we ain't giving you a one pager on this. So, you know, we show up ready to take action, which is mm -hmm. leading um, mm -hmm. and problem solving mm -hmm. and the exact opposite of how we need to show up because we're new to this space. We're the last people that know what the heck to be doing in these situations. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. The other way is we sort of show up and it's just like, well, tell me what to do. Like, yes. all right, like, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do? I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, and what the beauty of in the, I think the most important step for any white person to do, the most important step for me to do was that personal excavation. The work is here. Like I can't be affected. I can't show up in support of you. I can't, I can't show up and listen to you and, and truly hear you and see you until I figure, excuse my language, until my shit out. Like I've got some excavation to do. And this is, I'm two and a half, three years into this and I'm just, just dipping into it. And, you know, until that excavation has happened, it just, I don't know if it's possible to, to show up and truly listen and truly create a space where other folks feel comfortable to share. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just even a tangible example of like, typically for something like this, mm -hmm. I would have prepared the heck out of this. I would have had notes ready to go. I would have had my talking points. Mm -hmm. And it was, what I've learned is, I'm most valuable and I have the best conversations when I'm not prepared, when I feel like I just speak from, I, I'm just trying to be myself in this moment. Okay. And that used to be a very scary thing. It still is at times yeah. um, because I'm afraid of what I might say and what I might not say and the mistakes I might make. But I've learned and been told by um, one of our equity advisors, Zoe, is always talking about be unapologetic, like show up with love and yes. be unapologetic. Um, and in a, in a good way, unapologetic and like with from coming from a center of, of love and humanity. Yes. And so until that, but until that, I didn't get that until I can really feel it. And I've now seen the impact of showing up in those spaces. And it doesn't mean I get it right. It doesn't mean I don't fall down. It doesn't mean I create, I don't and create unintended harm because I know I do, but I, I'm committed to continuing to learn and grow. And it's only through those conversations. And when somebody does trust me enough to share the way you're willing to share with me or some others have what, and there, they can be hard things to hear, mm -hmm. but like you said, the best thing I can do, those are gifts. Mm -hmm. Those are the moments when I need to shut up and listen mm -hmm. and then not just like nod my head and say, okay, I got that is to go back and like, dig deeper into that. Why do I feel uncomfortable about that? What is that telling me? Listen to my body. So sorry to ramble, but that one is really is like the power that is so hard when people ask about like, what is this work for you? It's like, you gotta come, you gotta come feel it. I can't, I can't give you a one pager on this. You gotta feel it. That, so, so I love, so thank you for that, Rooney, because that, that's it. Cause usually when we show up um, in spaces as they opt in, talking about, you know, this is gonna be a learning journey and we're gonna center race, uh, race equity and racial literacy. Nine times out of 10, actually I would say 10 times out of 10, people think I'm gonna come and talk about being black, being an Afro-Latina and it's like, well, yeah, we'll get to that. But you pointed it, the core thing, 
it's really talking about whiteness. Mm. And talking about whiteness, not only as the macro component out here, but as you said, what has that meant for you? And taking that journey of personal excavation. Mm. And I don't know, Rooney, but I think um, I think part of the flaming out is I think it's scary. Mm. It and is. I think it's the thing that we're not doing. And I'm going to be specific. I think it's one of the biggest invitations that we are um, calling in, hoping for, imagining with as it relates to white people and specifically because you and I are here today, white men. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for what you shared because if you go back to that first year, can you, can you share with us, what was that like, right? What was it like first flaming out, then second going, oh shit, is that about talking about them? It's about talking about myself. It's about unpeeling, and I love the word excavating that you said. It's yeah. about me excavating me. Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, one of my biggest um, issues, if you will, or sort of question marks around when I heard what was happening with WMRJ is, you know, it's like this is an all white male space talking about race and, and um, racial issues. Uh, what do we, you know, that sounds a little, what's up with that? You know, I was like, this seems problematic. Um, but again, and, and I showed up because I have, I've known Jay for a long time. I know he's well, like I, I just know the man when, when he says show up by showing up typically is, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it was all the things you could talk about of like the white fragility. Um, it was I was filled with that. Um, it was it was hard. But the starting point really is is intentional with WRJ. Uh, we start with a, a, a podcast actually called um, Seeing White mm -hmm. and which is all about just that. Turn the lens. We're going to talk about race, but it's not in the way that you're used to. Mm -hmm. Buckle up. We're going to. We're going to, we're talking, you're talking to yourself here. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's educational first and foremost, as you yes. said, but it's educational a way that it's, it starts to internalize that. Um, and yeah, so that I think is the really important part of how we kick things off. But in, if you, if your question of like, what was that like for me? It was, it was, it was more of an intellectual exercise. Yeah. Um, and it felt, like, again, I had all the reasons why it's a Tuesday nights, it's eight o'clock. It's like, it's the summertime. It's in Burlington. It's like, oh, I've got friends who are out on the boat. I got to like, like I've got a million reasons why I can't, I don't have time to show up for this. Um, and it's until I really got in there and felt it. It was just, it's so easy to walk away because there's no, that there's not that connection. Yes. And so a couple of things. Because what we're speaking about, you know, you you uh, you use the word excavation, which I love. We're talking about personal awareness. We're talking about creating a a level of self awareness about who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I always share uh, with white colleagues and white friends is, I got lucky. Um, this world was not built for me. It was not designed for me. So I was pointed back to myself and I was pointed back to an understanding of my personal awareness, the awareness of who I am as a female, the awareness of who I am as a black uh, woman, the awareness that I, of who I am as a Latina, the awareness of who I am as someone who grew up socioeconomically at the bottom of the, of the hierarchy, I had to excavate that mm. to find the understanding of myself 
to, un to find the understanding of my worth, to stand in the understanding of my skills, my heart, my love, to effectively navigate the world uh, that we live in. Mm. Because it was not built for me and everything around me echoed and pointed and shared with me that I was not the norm, that I was not what was valued. And so, um, you know, our mutual friend talks about how a fish doesn't know it's in water. Mm. And so I think that where you come to this journey or white people come to this, um, this uh, the, these inflection points, these external inflection points, where I think as black indigenous people of color, we're living with these inflection points at all times that point us back to ourselves and to that personal journey of, of healing, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my co-founder at the Opta and Kelly and I, who is white, we always talk about my journey was I had to heal in order to evolve. Kelly has had to evolve with learning and education in order to heal. Mm, I love that. I love that. And as you're speaking to it, like it also, the evolution for me, again, the evolution is also the understanding that this is not like, this isn't a history lesson, right? So like so much is taught that this is, again, the unlearning is like, this isn't what was, this is here and now. And it white supremacy in, in itself has just evolved to where it is today. Um, and so seemingly a simple thing, but it, it, it's when you start to unpack that in the reality of it, it's not, it's, it's, it's really hard to, it's, it's that to me is like, it's really hard to unsee that. Um, and it's, and I know I'm only seeing, you know, the surface because mm -hmm. I can't feel it. I can't experience it. I have to learn about it. I have to have somebody trust me to tell them. And then I have to trust them to, you know, I have to believe that. And I have to lean into the discomfort of saying and recognizing I'm a part of that. Like that could be me like that. The things I am doing are replicating these feelings that have existed for, hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a really important part and a part that people struggle with white folks like myself struggle with is that it's, yeah, we, 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 we get, we get it. It, it happened. And it's like, so, and I wasn't even in that spot. I was more like, I know this stuff still exists, mm -hmm. but not to the level that I'm continuing to ex excavate. Mm -hmm. And, what I'd also like to point out too, for me again in this journey is it's white men for racial justice is rooted in racial justice work. And, yes. but this is intersectional. So this is not just about how to be a better white guy to BIPOC people. This is just how to be a better human. And so all the things we're learning <laughs> mm -hmm. and we're uncovering, like it is, it, it doesn't just transform my relationships with, with, with black folks it transforms my, it's transformed my relationship with the people I interact with on a daily basis with my, with my family, with my friends, with my coworkers, the way I see, the way I sh show up, the way I don't show up. Like it's so intersectional and, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just a quick story on that again, of this, like having these conversations that years ago I never would have had and are so important that are having now of just a, a friend of mine who is in the group, um, sharing his experience as being um, a gay man. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, just the trauma of, of having, to, when there's things that are happening in the world that are like attack on, on, on him and his humanity mm -hmm. with laws and that are, you know, fundamentally attacking who he is and sharing with me that experience of those things. To me, they're just headlines, right? I can be upset about them. I cannot agree with them, but they're headlines at the end of the day in some ways until there's proximity. But even then I was, I was proximate, proximate with him, but his sharing, his trust to share with me, like, and you know, like, you know, what often happens is the straight men in my life are people like, they don't reach out. Like, yeah. like they don't, 
you know, like there's what you that what the absence of what you're saying or what you're not saying says a lot. Yes. And he challenged me. He said, who like who in your life can you reach out to? Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking and it I have a, a coworker who I asked permission to share this. So it, and who identifies as a gay woman mm -hmm. and I have known her for eight, 10 years and work with her very closely. And I, after that conversation, a week or two later with, with a friend of mine in WMRJ, I just had found an opportunity and just said, you know, I'm, I just want to, I don't have any, I don't know what I'm even here to say other than to say, like, I see you, I see what's going on. And I, I'm, I, I'm, it's weighing on me in a different way. And I'm thinking about you and how this is, what it must be like. And I just want you to know that I'm thinking of you. I, I care about you. I have love for you and I'm here for you. And again, a seemingly small thing. It was amazing. And she, she, it was, she broke down and, mm -hmm. um, it was, what was amazing to me was to, to, for her to share how I was pretty, pretty much one of the, pretty much the only, I think she said like the first person outside of maybe a, a, a close family member who had said anything to her. Um, and that's, that sort of broke my heart in that moment in some way, because yes, I'm close with this person, but it's, this is a work relationship. So it, it just shows you that these conversations aren't happening. It's vulnerability that's just being human and having love for somebody and recognizing what others are going through just doesn't, it doesn't happen the way it should. And when it does, the transformational power that's there. is huge. The transformational power is huge, Rooney. And I want to thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for showing up. Um, and thank you for naming that, because this is one of the things that we talk about. I think particularly in our work settings, we have historically relegated DE&I as something that sits over here in our organizations. And a, care, uh, a, a few people that are diehard liberals are in this sort of vertical silo. Um, and a lot of times executives don't see how the skills that we are building um, as it relates to racial literacy and cultural competence aligned to racial justice are actually the evolution, we call them the evolution of skills that are literally required for us not only to center humanity in ourselves, but to show up as all of the headlines that McKinsey and Deloitte talk about, an empathetic leader, authentic leader. These skills are directly centering the evolution, the requirement, and the evolution of leadership that is required in our today times and in the future. These are future-proof skills. And they're really about centering humanity mm -hmm. and showing up with our heart, mm -hmm. which is something that has been so absent from our workplaces. So that's one thing I want to anchor about what you said. And the second thing I want to anchor is what you expressed and what you talked about. I hear joy. Mm. I hear humanity. I hear peace. I hear expansion. And I think a I think when white folks hear about this, and because we also call it, you got to do the work, you got to do the work. And so there's sort of this laborious and scary, and I don't want to do it, and I don't want to be called out, and I don't want to be all these things. But you just also talked about all of the beautiful aspects that come with stepping into the accountability and commitment to this education and this building of skills and this building of, uh, and this personal excavation. And it's so powerful and it's, and it, but again, it also for like 
again, myself, white men, like it's language we're not used to using. It's uncomfortable. Like, I, I mean, I can think of, I can think of many friends who maybe will watch this, maybe won't, who will either make fun of me to my face for the, some of the things and, or behind my back. And so there's, that's, it's just, it's just different. It's not how I was raised to tie. And I was raised with, a, with like love and respect. Um, but it's just not how I'm used to showing up. And one of the things that you were shared that made me really like popped into my head is that such an important part of this too. And I think it's, and I'll say for me, is still a part I'm working on. It is that it isn't, I'm, it's not, we're not, I'm not doing this work to save somebody or to help somebody. It's the, the, the most important switch, which again, I'm still struggle with this to work on is that the end, like this is, this is about, this is about like myself in a way, this is about saving myself. This is about healing myself as you shared with Kelly's experience. Um, this is about my humanity. It's not about me being in this elevated position or sound position and offering my assistance to others. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the personal work is. And that's like, that's, I can conceptualize that. I can hear our people talking about that, mm -hmm. but it's it all, and again, in full transfer, like, I don't always feel that. Mm -hmm. I do feel like sometimes it's external still. I do feel like it's me going out and I like, but when I feel, when I, when I have those moments where I feel that, mm -hmm. that's, that's the, that's the magic. That's the magic. Uh, I think that, yes. Uh, and it's, and, and, and Mooney, as you're talking, like, this is the part where honestly, we look at white people and go like, how do you not feel that? How, how is that not, how is that? not breaking your soul. Um, and this is the conditioning, right? This mm -hmm. is the programming. Mm -hmm. And this is why it takes education. This is why it takes commitment. This is why it takes unlearning and building new knowledge. And it takes connection and proximity mm -hmm. so that we understand and sit with the feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And all so, of that takes time. <laughs> yes, it does. Again, and I, and I come, always will come back to this as like, as I said, I mean, I'm, a, I'm on the infancy stage of this journey and it's a never ending journey. And, but that's, and that's what I love about it. Like you did, there is joy in this work. Mm -hmm. um, it is joy. Um, my, like an easy tangible example of that is, is every Tuesday night, these calls we have eight o'clock, PM Eastern time. I've had a long day. It's a Tuesday week's just beginning. Half the time I'm drag myself into these. I'm like, Oh, I, maybe I just going to skip this one or I'm not really feeling it tonight. I had a, an hour and a half later, I hang up that call without a doubt every single week. And I am so happy I was there. Even if the conversations are hard, which they often are, there's so much joy and, and like love in that community that I'm having a hard time sleeping Tuesday nights. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the power of it. It's, it's so much about like, whether it's a WMRJ experience or whatever your experience is, is finding community because that's where the accountability is. That's, that's what yes. keeps you coming back. You need to find, or I needed to find people um, to hold me accountable when I, when I was, when I'm flaming out and then I'm in turn, I'm there for when, when they're flaming out. Um, and it's that, that sort of love that brings us back together. Um, and, and one other thing that's on my mind again, is just to, if for folks, maybe you're thinking about, well, so how does this like translate? What does this mean? Especially if I'm a, a white male CEO, like, yes. how, am I just going to go like talk about love and like all this stuff? How do like, where does, how does this translate to work? Um, mm -hmm. A recent example that I would share from our community here at Rhino was that um, we're a three shift operations. We're running 24 seven. We, we are an inclusive hirer. Uh, we follow sort of a, a model after a B Corp partner, Grayston Bakery. Um, and so we have fully inclusive hiring and about, a uh, six months, eight months ago, um, 
I had some folks come to me, supervisors out in our operation, um, and saying we've got a we've got a serious problem. Of we we talk about being an inclusive hire, we say we're a recovery friendly workplace. We hire a lot of folks who are on their recovery journey, but we've got a lot of we've got a lot of we're not a recovery friendly workplace. We've got a lot of drug use happening, people coming into work impaired, people using illegal substances here, people selling in the parking lot. This is not a safe space. We need to do something. And the do something that was being suggested in most cases um, was we need to, you know, do we need to have more cameras outside? Do we need to have somebody checking at the door? Do we need to have patrols at night? Because, you know, it's third shift, it's 3 a.m., no, who, not many people around. Um, and so I, you know, that's, but that's also not who we are here at Rhino, and that's not where I wanted to start. And I recognize we've got a problem. Like we can't say we're a recovery friendly workplace and have this stuff going on. So the approach we decided to take was at an all company meeting, we, we do once a month with everybody in the company, 200 plus people um, across the different shifts. We, I just spoke about this and I said, we say we're this, here's the reality. And this is not a safe environment that we're creating for our folks who are in recovery. And I can stand here to say that I, I'm not okay with it. I'm not going to tolerate it. I can also say, what's being proposed as solutions are more lights outside patrol bag checks more cameras inside and i can say that's not the culture i want but i'm willing to go there if that's our only option because we can't have what's happening happening but what i want to do before we go there is invite everybody to a conversation and so this is i think is where you sort of talking about disrupting is yes Let's not demonize, let's, let's not suppress, let's invite, let's bring people to the table. And so I said, we're gonna host three rounds of focus groups. Anybody can co show up, whether you're on a recovery journey or you're just a concerned rhino and wanna be support. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what's happening and what are some options that we could do. And we did that and we held these focus groups and people showed up um, and from those conversations, amazing things have happened. One of which being we now have, um, which again was a, an idea that came from folks here who are in recovery. So it would be wonderful to have a space where we can gather together in an affinity space. And so we've now, we now have a rhinos for recovery group. It was designed to, um, meet once a week. And we'll, interesting part was we, we said, let's, well, let's not like, we already have an onsite resource, um, recovery coach, but this is different. And so we had three people raise their hand and say, I'd be willing to like help co-facilitate this as an internal rhino um, in on my re recovery journey. And so they stepped forward, they got some training from our recovery coach and they now lead, um, it's become weekly because there was so much demand for it, sessions where they get to gather as a group, speak about their experience here, have a safe space, and what that's done is create, it just raises the conversation. It creates this environment where we're not demonizing, we're welcoming and we're bringing people to the table to talk about this. And we've seen a massive decrease along with doing some other things, none of which are more lights, more patrols, because that's not, people don't want to be, have somebody knock on their window when they're taking the break in their car. Like that's not what they want. And so like, again, I, I say that because it starts with centering like the human. And yes. I had a choice in that moment. It doesn't mean I was, it was the right one. And it doesn't mean it was, I was the only one that thought of it, but as a group, we had a choice of how we want to handle this situation. And when you start with the human, you typically end up in a, in my opinion, a better look and a better sort of endpoint. Love that. And thank you so much for sharing. And I would offer, uh, Rooney, that's leadership. It is humanity-centered leadership. And it started first and foremost by you modeling that and choosing a different way that centered the collective humans in the organization. And I think that that is what is possible. Uh, new solution, reimagine ways of operating, working, and coming together as a workplace where people are seen valued and supported 
versus demonized or excluded. So thank you so much for that. We're going to shift, but before we shift, I want to anchor a couple of the things that we've talked about. One, um, and feel free to chime in, Mooney. One, we've talked about that this um, beginning this journey first and foremost starts with choosing um, a personal a, a journey of learning and education, and that learning and education, while yes, it is external, it is predominantly about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that personal awareness and that personal excavation as you spoke to, but really beginning the work in digging deep internally and really excavating and understanding yourself as well as the lens of whiteness. Um, I think that for many people will say, well, what if I don't have access to a community like WMRJ? I think that there are many resources. I think one of the anchoring for starting points uh, of WMRJ is the Seeing White podcast. Uh, it's on Seeing Radio. It's, I believe, an eight or a nine part uh, series, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. Uh, downloaded at any of your favorite podcast applications. And I think there is a workbook that goes along with it that can be Googled. But I think there are these baseline, uh, and I think that's even gone on to be part two, part three series. But I think, as you said, when we talk about racial justice, we talk about racial equity, social justice, we always, I think white people tend to say, oh, uh, let's talk about black, let's talk about brown. And we're not saying not to and that there is not education and learning there and understanding our true history, the indigenous, uh, the impact that we've had on the indigenous community in this country. But it really is about understanding uh, the power structures of advantage, uh, the social identity of whiteness, and the implications and the programming that it's had on all of us. And the only other, another resource I would throw in there is um, one we use fairly early on as well in WMRJ, for me again, is extremely powerful, is Leila Saad's Mean White Supremacy um, book. Yes. And it's less of a book for me than, than like a workbook. And it is, it, it, don't just read it. Like I've, I've done the thing where you flip through and read it and sort of look at the journaling prompts. Like that, that book I've now done three times and each time you can get pretty deep. And that to me is like, those are the types of resources that are the work um, because it gives you the information, but really it requires you to do that, that personal um, reflection. Beautiful. Thank you. Love Leila. Interviewed her for our podcast. She is phenomenal. Um, the third thing I'm going to offer that I think you spoke to very much is, a co is community. Mm -hmm. Who is your accountability partner? Who is that community um, that is going to help you, as, as you stated, Rooney, not flame out, keep you in, in the journey? Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the third thing um, that we are offering as we anchor the first half of our conversation. And I think for folks that are saying, where do I start? Like, I'm a Black Indigenous person of color. Where do I start in our organization? Um, and to be honest, most, you know, leadership and then, you know, 80%, 90% of organizations are white, Rooney, right? And so where do we start? I always offer, and I would love your perspective on this as well, Rooney. I always start is, Understand your organization, understand where the leaders are in your organization, and nine times out of 10, don't go alone. Uh, I think that these conversations and being able to introduce the conversation of, we need external support, or you know, our organization um, may have a DEI organization. Maybe it's the third or fourth hat that the HR leader is having. But I would open, or I would, I would introduce this opportunity for evolution, education, and learning um, via as a collective, not as a single Black Indigenous person going directly to the CEO or to the HR person and saying, you know, this has to happen. I think mm -hmm. it needs to be brought in uh, in community uh, because very honestly, I think there's there's a lot of risk for BIPOCs. 
-hmm. going and having these conversations solo. I don't know if there's something else you would offer, Rooney. Um, only thing that came to mind, because I think this is a, a hard one for me to speak to because I can feel my, I can feel the challenge of that from my position. Um, okay. But, but I, I think what often might help it is, and again, the, the B Corp community is, is a good resource. So, you know, maybe there's an op option to find out who are other, because there's many other B Corp leaders in, in a space like WMRJ. Mm -hmm. And if you can create conversations mm -hmm. between, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if I can, if I have, if, if I'm invited to t speak to somebody, that's part of the work I'm doing is how can I go as a, one of our equity advisors says, go get your boys. Like how, how can I go get more of us than that? So if you can maybe invite your leader, Hey, I heard about this thing. Would you be like, would you be willing to have a conversation with X person? Or would you be willing to look into this, reach out to Jay, the leader of B Corp can be like, how like those I think start to seem to be spaces where white male leaders, again, who, who haven't started to do some of the work themselves are more willing to listen and potentially helps them get into the, and listen in a different way versus it being what you said before, which I think a lot of, for me, I've always been afraid of is it's just a box. Like what is the box checking exercise? I don't want to bring something in here that does that. And I think that's often the response. So that may be an attempt, especially as more people, the community grows. Um, yeah. That creates an opportunity for people to invite, to speak to others who they might relate to and be able to sort of speak the same language, if you will, in that moment. So, Rooney, can I just tell you how much I love that? <laughs> I, I love that. Absolutely. Go get your boys. Yeah. Because it is. And there is something, uh, oh, my God, that is powerful. And so I do hope that that is absolutely something um, with regards to uh, leveraging the WMRJ community, right? And, and if I may, I just want to add like a fourth thing to your um, yes. summary um, is around is around the concept of proximity. And mm -hmm. so yes. again, this the work doesn't necessarily need to mean like you need to go like find a black person and talk to them about race. But what it does mean is sh like, I actually probably would say that's the wrong thing to do. It would be just, but to sh as you start to do this again, my own experience was as I started to try to create more proximity, I wasn't leading with like, I'm, I'm, I've been pre in WMRJ and I've done Layla Saad, me and white supremacy. I'm ready to talk now. Like it was, no, it was show up and just be, be more human with that person. And, you know, in, personal example of like, rather than just like talking about sports with this one guy, because that's all we've heard sports and like sort of working out like simple things that I wasn't doing, just at, like asking more, trying to create more of that human connection that has in this example led to a much deeper, more meaningful conversation that at his invitation has opened up to be more about race and his experience here. And so it, it's just, it's the humanity in it. You don't need to run around and, and again it's not the saviorism of running around and trying to like do stuff but it's even if, if that's like my motivation that's like oh like wake up or you go do like go be a human mm -hmm. i needed that and i just show up in these spaces much differently and i'm intentionally seeking out spaces that i've historically been uncomfortable in or i've been absent in mm -hmm. and from that so much happens mm -hmm. so i think the proximity and being aware of how to get proximate is really important. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming and, and, and bringing us back to that. And I want to actually, I want to dig deeper and give people a specific example, because I do get this question a lot, like, how do, how do I get closer to black people? Um, and I love this example where you talk about a colleague where all you all, you talked about was sports and that's the superficial stuff, right? That's the, bro bro you know sports thing um my guess is is just saying hey i hear you talk about your wife a lot she must be a special person how did you guys meet mm. and so i just want to give folks like an example of what that sounds like and what that looks like uh not hey the you know i don't know who the teams are i shouldn't even try you know this team and that team you know, the score of the game last night, right? I, to your point, it's actually quite simple. Uh, 
and it's very human, um, it feels hard, I can imagine, because there's not a practice of doing it. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I think the challenge is too, is like taking it from just general small talk. Cause even if you're just like, oh, hey, how are you? Or like, what do you do for like, you know, like, what did you do this week? Even if you're sort of like doing that, it's like, how do you actually show up with in like, cause people can sense this stuff. Like you can sense when somebody's just, mm -hmm. you know, doing the small talk thing for the conference. But mm -hmm. if you ask somebody, you know, like, how are you doing? Like you can, there's a way to add. people feel that when there's like genuine interest and there's emotion to it. And again, getting to know like what people, what matters to people, that's what unlocked this conversation. Again, that's where I started in this conversation. And within two hours we were, deep down a total rabbit hole of like his experience growing up it, it, and like, and I was like, these are places that I, I thought we'd be like, maybe I'd, if he ever wanted to talk about this, it would be months later. But what that also showed me is there's a hunger for that. He's starving for somebody that he can trust to have that conversation. And, and that's a two, like, and I like, that's a, that's a win for him. And that's a win. Like to have that, him share that stuff with me was invaluable. And it's, it started with just like a it's very simple invitation to try to dig a little deeper in getting to know him. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I always share my survival, my existence on this planet um, has been cred predicated on me knowing and understanding you. Uh, and I mean you, Rumi, as a white man, as a white person, uh, to the largest and fullest extent um, that I understand myself. Mm. But the reverse hasn't been true. And so this opportunity for us to create connection through proximity and through genuine interest, I think is so critical in us coming together and fortifying our strengths um, in really changing our world and changing our work environments. Mm. And I think it's a great segue in talking about what the B Corp community, what B Lab has done mm. in making a deliberate investment um an interest in creating the level program um i have to do a, a shout out to farmer c because i my personal belief is that whenever there's change and movement find the black woman because there's always a black woman somewhere in the mix so farmer c shout out to you um for the co-creation of this idea with the b lab folks and shout out to b lab um and getting off the porch is, I think, is one of the terms that the equity partners, uh, Zoe and, and P always share with you all. Mm -hmm. um, and not just saying, hey, we have a commitment to this emerging segment of Black, Indigenous, and, and women of color, but we're actually going to create the resources around them in order to get them more uh, to get them certified, not just because it's a benefit to them, which is part of this, it's, but because our participation and our inclusion inside of the B Corp community and movement is critical for its evolution mm -hmm. and its relevance and its modeling to the reality of what is happening, not only across entrepreneurship, small, medium businesses, but large enterprise. Mm. And it's given you and I the opportunity to be here today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and the, the, my sort of vision into that, I would root it in like my experience at the B Corp Champions Retreat. And mm -hmm. it was so nice to have one of these back for the first time after COVID, but mm -hmm. I've been, fortunate to have attended, I don't know exactly, but probably seven or eight champions retreats. Okay. Um, and I can say this, and you can, you, I've seen the evolution of them, but this year's by far away was the most impactful that felt for me, but I could like for the community, it felt like the community 
And because of a lot of this, the work that was done, the level folks being there and being elevated and, and many other voices, it was, that was like a very intense and powerful few days. And not the other ones haven't been, but the other ones felt like they've been built more for me. Um, mm -hmm. And they've now, I think, are on the journey to having it be built for the community um, mm -hmm. in a community that it, they're still working to build that because this community still looks a lot like me. Um, but I believe, again, from my seat, what I've seen, um, it feels like a more welcoming community in that space feels safer for everybody, for everybody, not just for, for me. And let's talk about that, because I think that that thank you for sharing that context, Rene. And let's talk about that, because I think this is the part that when we create uh, opportunities in workplaces, just like you gave the example, mm -hmm. uh, you offered the example earlier about what um, you did in creating um, a wider net of support uh, for Rhino. Did you feel you lost anything, Rooney? Did you feel that anything was short change for you as an experience? Heck no. Whenever we center voices and create space for others, for 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 those who are need their voice heard, we no. Like I think we've been very fortunate to sort of have that human centered approach. I'm very fortunate to have grown up in a business that that's been sort of the core of what we've done. Mm -hmm. And no, to your question, absolutely, we did not lose anything. There was only more to gain. Mm -hmm. Only more to gain. And I think, thank you. And I know that that's how we felt. And that was my first champions uh, retreat. Uh, but what I saw exemplified across the B Corp community is the possibility mm. of all of us coming together Mm -hmm. and literally reimagining what this feels like, not only in our companies, what it feels like in our workplaces, what it feels like across the B Corp community, but what we, you know, dare I say, what we have the possibility to create across society. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe your question was to that, did I lose anything at the retreat? No, I mean, I did it. it did I, did I feel less comfortable at times? Absolutely. And I, a lot of what I was reflecting on actually with, with some other folks too, was how would I have, I had felt had I not been sort of on this two at that time for sort of two year mm -hmm. journey of racial justice mm -hmm. work and my own activation that we talked about, mm -hmm. I could, I could feel how I probably would have had a very different experience, but mm -hmm. I think thankfully the way I was able to show up in that space, again, as we talked about before, it felt like a gift because it felt more honest. It felt like it was for, it was for me, but in a different way it was, it was not for me to feel comfortable or elevated. It was for me to feel, it felt real. Um, and it was an invitation to how I can better support the community that is, looks less like me and more like all of us. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and I think my hope is, is that the part two parts that you just said that part of where it may have felt if you envision yourself having not been on the two and a half year journey that you were on mm -hmm. um what would that have felt like and yet because you were on this journey you were uncomfortable you were able to feel that and my guess is to still opt in and and be a part of that yeah that's the difference is versus the to dig in versus mm -hmm. check out like mm -hmm. potentially before there's a lot of, for me, again, the, the, the fragility of it is, Oh, that's just, the person's just angry. It's, you know, all the mm -hmm. typical things you, you hear people talk about, but my own defense, I was sort of resilient enough to recognize the uncomfortability and dig into that and, and challenge to why and sit through it and then recognize that as the gift. But I, I, I think maybe not in the B Corp space, but in a lot of spaces, that's a challenge for how people, how do they react? Do they dig in or do they check out? And I think most folks that with my experience would check ahead, would check out. And that's, that's the work right there. Like, how do we, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? And so now you know i'm gonna i'm gonna dig into how do we how do we not make that happen so 
So Rooney, you called in something very beautiful because as you know, people like me uh, and others, we've been having this conversation for a really long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have found, we have tried to find multiple ways um, to close that gap, to create that proximity, to identify, to create that connection, um, to encourage the self-awareness, um, to foster motivation that doesn't have to be at the, at the result of us being killed and murdered. Um, and so as a white male CEO and executive, what is, what is your invitation um, to your fellow colleagues in the community and outside of B Corp as a whole um, to disrupt with love? Not to sound like a broken record, but it is, you've got to disrupt yourself. You've got to disrupt your own comfort. Um, and we, we have to disrupt our normal patterns of behavior and what f what we should have been taught. And so, again, I, I know it sounds broken, but I, I just, it's that to me is the key is to chat, like just challenge yourself to, even though if you think, you know, trust me, you don't, we don't. And you got to find ways to have that exposure um, and find ways to create that proximity to whatever the issue might be or to whatever the situation might be. And so I, I, I feel like I didn't give a good answer there, but I, I just, it feels like that's, that's the key is have the self-awareness that there's something to learn here. There's a lot to unlearn and find your community um, and be willing to, and be willing to prioritize like it's so easy and even with our group with people who are like passionate and care about this stuff the number one reason like it's they've got we've got priorities yeah. and they're real and like their 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 work their family these are tuesday nights they're long weekends they're real and i've moved to a space now where i feel like this is this there's nothing more important than this work because as we've talked about, it touches everything. This doesn't just yes. show up. This isn't just how I show up as a leader in a, in a, in a boardroom or as I walk around our factory floor, this has impacted how I go home to my partner. Mm -hmm. And this is, and of anybody, like I've, I've had the most over the last few years have, this has been, I've had to disrupt myself because I'm sitting here talking and there'd be a lot of people who would laugh and say, he's talking about that. I've lived my life for, 32 years focused on myself, thinking about me and how I'm going to continue to benefit myself in selfish ways. I've done things that have hurt others, hurt others that I care about because I'm centering myself. And so for me to talk about this stuff is hard because I know there's people who would look and say, that's a bunch of bullshit coming from him. And yeah, it was. But what, and again, and I don't think I've got, like, I, I'm still on the journey, but I'm committed to the journey. And I see now what I haven't seen before is, is the impact of, oops, sorry, of, 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 again, even if it is centering myself, like my salvation is in the connection and the love with other people. And I did not, I did never, I did not get that. Um, and so I went off a little bit on a tangent here, but it, again, I, I think it's important because I, this has been the most transformational thing for me personally. Um, and it's been hard because I'm looking back, I'm looking at myself and I'm ashamed. I'm, in, I'm heartbroken by how in situations I've behaved. Um, and I could sit there and wallow about that. I could be, in it, but all I can do now is learn from that and commit to being better. And that again, in 
it also it is selfish because I want to be better for myself because I know what that I know I now know what this work does for me personally. But it's a different it's a different selfish. It's a it's a that collective humanity, the evolution towards that collective humanity you talked about. So sorry, I think I went way off on your question. No, I. I think this is what's real, Rooney. I think this is the part, these are the things we don't talk about. Mm. And I think that, I do think that there's a difference. There's a, there's a difference between being unaware and driving um, selfishly for me and mine, right? Mm. And then there's the, 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 the accountability of excavating yourself for the liberation, for the evolution, for the expansion of who you are in support and service to the whole. Mm -hmm. And in that, we in that there's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. There's no lose-lose. But it is a journey. It requires that personal commitment and that personal, that courage to look within and excavate it and look at it for the truth of what it is mm -hmm. and to examine it for this, like, does it serve you? Does it serve you not being, not centering humanity? Mm -hmm. It did for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you are connecting is, um, but where you are now and where you will continue to go, will continue to evolve who you are that creates an, a more engaged, um, vulnerable, truthful, loving human mm. to your family, to your colleagues, to your friends, and to those that get to be in your space mm. as a leader. And so with that invitation, you know, I think the B Corp community has always modeled itself as, as being on the front lines of change, of caring about not just the profit aspect of making money, but caring about our planet and caring about our responsibility to people. And so I think that for me, the call to action through what you have modeled, the vulnerability that you have shared and through the truth, right? Like it's the raw truth um, that as a community and as a B Corp, we're modeling this evolution and it's messy. There's no straight line, right? There's ebbs and flows and dips mm -hmm. that, that come along this. But my goal is by having this conversation, you are helping model um, we are helping model the evolution and the opportunity for all B Corp leaders and coming together um, and changing our organization, changing ourselves, and changing the world. That's a journey I want to be on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Thank you so, so much, Rooney, for being here. Thank you for modeling. Thank you for being a friend, a colleague, and a partner in this movement of change as a B Corp um, and as a human. I appreciate you. And right back at you. Thank you again for the invitation to be here for the conversation, the opportunity to learn from you um, and get to share my story. Um, and really, really appreciate it. This has been wonderful was much needed today. Um, so love to you and to everybody who's been involved. Much love. Thank you. And just a couple of actions, please, for all of my uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, particularly the females, please sign up for the Level Program. Um, we're here to come together and evolving uh, the business landscape. For all of our white male friends and colleagues out there, please join WMRJ.org. Um, because together um, we can make anything happen. Thank you all. Thank you so much.